Quickly, don't forget we're going to have a reading quiz on Chapter 2. We'll do all of Chapter 2 for the reading quiz, uh, and that'll be on Tuesday. So just be reading that over the next few days. And uh, you can look. Go ahead. I don't know yet. Probably Chapter 1 and a portion of Chapter 2. I don't think that we're going to get through all of Chapter 2. Probably what we'll do is we'll do all of Chapter 1 and sort of the first half of Chapter 2. You know how the chapters are sort of broken into the physics portion and then the biology portion? We'll probably just do the physics portion. Or maybe not even all the physics portion. We'll see what we get to. All right? I don't really care. I'm going to have to take the exam. Do you want to take it? Yeah. No, I do care, actually, and we are going to take the exam. <laughs> that was a joke, the whole I don't care thing. But I do care, actually. All right? Um, let's see. One more little thing about friction. Um, talked about how you can change the friction between two objects in a couple of different ways. One, you can just change the material, right? You can have steel on ice, or you can have rubber on wood. The rubber on wood has a higher coefficient of static friction, and so it has more friction. The other way that you can increase the frictional force is by doing what? The other way that you can increase the frictional force is by doing what? The first way is to increase the coefficient of static friction. What's the second way to increase the frictional force? Well, kinetic friction is a type of friction. That's right, Carly. Um, well, what's a way that I can increase the kinetic friction or the static friction? Remember that you had the pin on the table? Uh, that would, if you decrease the normal force, what would that do to the frictional force? Increase the normal force. That's right. So if you increase the normal force, then that will increase the friction, right? And you did this little experiment that you all went home and showed your friends and stuff, where if you push on it, it increases the frictional force. Well, it can't move it because you're just pushing down. You're increasing the normal force. And remember, pants, belts, right, operate by friction. So they increase the normal force on your waist to hold your pants up. Okay? Um, so those are two ways to increase the frictional force. Likewise, if we decrease the normal force, then the frictional force will also decrease. So, for example, with this table, if I push on it like this, if I push down on it, I increase the normal force. But if I pull up on it, I do what to the normal force? I decrease the normal force. So imagine if I'm pushing this table. Say I have a situation where I'm pushing it like this, or I'm pulling it like this. In which case, let me draw a picture of both of those. We'll say that it's a box. In this case, I have a force applied in the downward direction. In this case, I have a force applied in the upward direction. In which case is the normal force greater? In which case is the normal force greater? And hence, the frictional force will be greater. Is the normal force greater here, or is it greater here? Let's do it as a clicker question, actually. So is it A, the normal force is greater, or B? So in which case is the normal force bigger? Is it A or B? Where is the normal force bigger? All right, I'll stop at 23, 23. Almost everybody is here today. Uh, a is the right answer. Very good. Uh, because I have this extra force that's pushing down, it's just like the pin. If I push down with a force, it increases the normal force. Oh, let's see. Y'all want to joke now? Uh, did you hear I'm in the news today? There was a kidnapping at the school down the street. Did y'all hear about that? It's okay. He woke up. <laughs> okay, where was I? Okay, yeah, so our normal force is bigger when I'm pushing like this. So 
y'all know this, right? If you have something that's really big and heavy, you don't you don't push it like this. Instead, you pull it from behind. If you have a big piece of furniture, you pull it from behind. Which leads me to wonder why when we go to the grocery store, how do we go around the grocery store? Pushing down, right? So we're increasing the normal force of our grocery cart, and it's not very efficient. So I say to you that next time you go to the grocery store, instead of pushing your grocery cart around like this, that instead you should walk around like this. And if anybody at Rouse's or Walmart or wherever it is that you shop, if they say, what are you doing? You say, I'm decreasing the normal force on this grocery cart. All right? Okay? We'll do that right after you go to McDonald's. And what are you going to order at McDonald's? <laughs> the Newton Burger, right. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, that's how we can, if we decrease the normal force, then we also decrease this frictional force. Uh, let's see, before we move on to torques, I just want to show you a couple things because it's kind of cool. At the end of the semester, we're going to go to the rec center. On our very last day, we'll have like a little, we'll just have class over at the rec center. They have a classroom upstairs. We'll meet up there for a little bit. Some of you will do presentations. You'll do your little presentations then. Not little, your monumental presentations at that time. And then we'll go down into the weight room and the gym. We'll just sort of play around with some stuff. But I want to show you some things. Um, let's see, what was I want to show you? Oh, yeah, the hack squat. You know what the hack squat is? No, the hack squat. This is the hack squat. I am this my wife. Isn't she beautiful? Yes is the right answer. Yes. Okay. So, anyway, this is the hack squat. And the hack squat is a type of inclined plane, right? Inclined plane is a simple machine. It allows you to push up a weight uh, with less force than the actual weight that you need. So, on the hack squat, which is an inclined plane, you put these plates onto the bars and then you push up and down with your legs. Now, how do you think, if I put, say, 50 pounds of weight or 90 pounds of weight on the, on the hack squat, on the bars here, how much is the force that I have to push on the shoulder pads, how much is it going to increase by? Is it going to increase by 90 pounds? As if I put 90 pounds on the, uh, on the bars, is the amount of force that I have to push up, is it going to increase by 90 pounds? More than 90 pounds or less than 90 pounds. Let me write these down, and then I'll, I'll explain. I, I can see that y'all don't really understand the question. 90 pounds greater than 90 pounds or less than 90 pounds. Let me explain the question again. So it takes a certain amount of force to push this bar up, right? We can measure that force. Um, if I put extra weights, extra plates on the bar, say I put 90 pounds on the bar, two 45-pound plates on the bar, then it takes extra force for me to push that thing up, right? It's heavier, so it takes extra force. Is the amount of extra force required to push it up, is it going to be equal to 90 pounds, less than or greater than 90 pounds, or less than 90 pounds? Which is it going to be? A, B, or C. The amount of extra force required to push that thing up, is it 90, greater than 90, or less than 90? Now, I'm not talking about the total force, right, because the whole bar, it has weight, too. I'm talking about the extra force. Okay, nobody's really getting it. Okay, there are right two of you there, got it, so. No. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so it's going to take how much weight? Let me just, I'll stop. I'll stop. The answer is C. All right, it's less than 90. Listen, it takes a certain amount of weight to lift it without the bar. Right? The amount of weight that's required to lift it is some portion of the weight that the whole thing weighs. Right? This, this is the force weight. It acts down and towards the Earth. However, I can split that force vector into two different vectors, 
and the amount of force required to push off of here will be equal to the force here as component of that weight. So when I put 90 pounds onto the bar, I don't push with an extra 90 pounds of weight. In fact, I only push with a, a small fraction of that, maybe half that. If you put 90 pounds, you're only putting out about maybe an extra 45 or 50 pounds. It's an inclined plane, right? That's a simple machine. That's what simple machines do. They make stuff easier for us to do. So the hack squat is a, a simple machine, and it allows you to lift heavier weights with less force than you would otherwise. In fact, every device in the, in the, weight, in the weight room, especially everything that's not a machine, that's, or rather that is a machine, like a cable machine or a plate-loaded machine or whatever, that those are, those are all simple machines in one way or another, and they make lifting heavier things easier. So if you put 150 pounds on a simple machine, you're not really lifting 150 pounds. You're really lifting something else. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, did I confuse you completely? Yes, that, that was really what I set out to do this morning. I thought today, in my 151 class, I'm going to confuse them completely. I'm really glad that I succeeded in that. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to it, okay? We'll see that again if you didn't get that. Okay, um, let's move on to torques. And then that'll sort of wrap up the physics section of this. And we'll move over to the AMP, the anatomy and physiology portion. Uh, torques. Torques are similar to forces. You know, forces cause acceleration. That's a basic premise of Newton's second law, that if I have a force, it causes the velocity to change or it causes the acceleration. Forces cause acceleration. In a very similar way, torques cause acceleration um, in a circle. So, cause, cause. torques cause acceleration to occur in a circular path. Just like a force are very similar to a force, rather, but it's going to cause this acceleration to move into a circular path. Uh, our torque is defined as, we calculate our torque. Our torque is equal to F times R, but in particular, it is uh, the perpendicular portion of F. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say that I have some object, a bar, or whatever. It rotates about that point. And if I apply a force to it in this direction, then it's going to cause that bar to move in a circular direction. So this is my bar right here. If I pull up in this direction, it's going to cause it to accelerate but it, or to move in a circular path. That's what torques do. They cause things to move in a circular path. Now, this little symbol right here means that it's only the force, or the component of the force, that's perpendicular to the moment arm, we call it, or the object that's rotating. So let's say, for example, that instead of a force like that, we have a force like, like this. Now that force, it has two different components. We can break that force into two different components. We can say that it has a component that is in that direction and a component that's in that direction. And the only component of that force that causes torque is this one, because that one is perpendicular to the moment arm. So this little symbol right here just means whatever force is perpendicular to the moment arm is what will cause the torque. The converse of that is, or the uh, I guess the converse, is that a force along the moment arm and the moment arm that's just this thing it's the uh, it's actually a little more complicated than this but we can just think of it as whatever it is it's rotating force along the moment arm 
uh, causes no torque. All right. So imagine a couple different ways. To open the door requires a torque, right? I push on the door. I push on it with a force that's perpendicular to the door. That's the most efficient way to open the door is to push straight onto the door. I don't push over here because that's, that's a lot harder to open the door because part of the force is acting along the moment's arm and part of the force is acting perpendicular to the moment's arm. You can try that later today. Next time you go into your class, instead of opening the door like this, I want you to instead open it like this. And it's a lot harder to open the door when you open it like this just because a lot of your force is not causing the torque at all. It's causing nothing to happen at all. It's just pushing on the door. All right. Another way to get no torque at all is if I push over here. Am I ever going to open this door? What is it about this that's causing no torque at all? If I look at that equation, what is it about that equation that gives me zero torque? What is actually zero? R is zero. R is the distance from the axis of rotation to wherever the force is applied. So if I'm pushing at the axis of rotation, which is right here for the door, then I get no torque at all. Similarly, another way to not open the door, I have to step into the hallway. And some of you aren't going to be able to see me, but just listen, okay? Are you okay, Bria? So if I have... I push in this direction, I'm not going to change the motion of the door at all, right? Now, what is it about that that gives us zero torque? Why am I getting no torque in that case? I'm not perpendicular, right? In fact, then my force is along the same line as the moment arm. Let me draw a picture for that in case you didn't see. Or here. Hmm? Morgan, you're not on my pictures, are you? Hold this, Morgan. All right. So if, I, if I'm trying to move this in this direction, if I push like this, I'm never going to move it in this direction. So it's the same for the door. If you push on the door in this direction, then you're never going never gonna to open it. Okay? So you can have zero moment arm. R can be zero. Or you can have a force that's not perpendicular, that is along the moment arm in this direction. That causes no torque. Um, and then you can have something in between where the force is uh, somewhere in between, like right here. And then only a portion of that force will actually cause torque. Try that next time you go to a class. It's surprisingly difficult to open that door if you're pushing at an oblique angle. Caitlin. The door is going in a circle. Well, it's a semi it's circular path. Yeah, it very much is a circular path. So, uh, All right, so this is our door. Hold this. All right, if I push this and I open the door, and it inscribes a circle. Right? If I go all the way around, it's going to come back to the same part. So you're right, it's not a full circle, but it is a, a circular path. Is that clear? Okay, so those are torques. Uh, it comes up a lot in the body. Let's just do a simple problem. You could see a simple problem like this on the test. Again, you're not going to have a whole lot of math on the test, but you'll have some. Uh, let's say that I have, I don't know, a seesaw, for example. Say I have a seesaw. Let's say that the total length of that seesaw, let's see, a seesaw, how many meters is a seesaw, roughly? About three meters. Yeah, it's about eight, nine, ten feet. So we'll just say it's three meters. Um, Let's say that my son, Micah, is right here. And Micah, let's say he's about let's say he's about twenty five kilograms. Right? And I'm about seventy kilograms. I'm over here and I'm about seventy kilograms. I'm gonna say seventy five just to make the math a little easier. And I'm going to say that this is four meters to make the math easier. 
That's a pretty big seesaw, but we'll say it's four meters. Okay. Don't you wish that you had a little pin and you could just do all different colors and erase things very easily? All right. So now I want to know where can I sit on this seesaw so that we'll be balanced, right? you have done problems like this before, right? You, you have in your head if you haven't done them on paper, but you certainly don't. You ever been on a seesaw with a little kid, right? Where do you have to sit? Do you sit really far out or do you sit far in? You sit in, right. The reason is, is that because you have a big weight in comparison to the kid. And in order to provide the same torque on both sides, which if it's balanced, that's what it means, is that you have the same amount of torque on both sides. And in order to provide then the same torque on both sides, because you have a big weight, you have to decrease the length of your moment arm. All right, so we can say that the torque on the left side, which is going to be, uh, what's that, a counterclockwise torque, I'll show you what I mean by that, must equal the torque on the right-hand side, which is a clockwise torque. And I also know that I need to jump on somewhere that's closer to the middle, but I don't know exactly how far. I want to know what is this distance, and I'll call it x. All right, let me t tell you what I mean by this clockwise, counterclockwise business. This is my seesaw. It goes like this. Okay? If I pull down on this direction, like Micah is sitting here and, it, and he goes down like this, what direction is my seesaw going? Is it clockwise or counterclockwise? That's counterclockwise. If I pull down on this side, that's me. I'm on this side. What direction is that? Clockwise. So that's what this means. Counterclockwise means that this, this force causes a counterclockwise torque this force causes a clockwise torque. And those need to be equal. Now the counterclockwise force will be the force perpendicular times the length of the moment arm, and the clockwise will be the force perpendicular times the moment arm for that side. Now the forces, let's see, I've given a mass here. What is the, the, the weight of the boy? If he's 25 kilograms, what's his weight? His mass is 25 kilograms. That's a measure of his, you know, what's it called? What's it called? Your mass is a measure of what? Inertia, right. Inertia. Uh, so what is his weight? How do we find his weight? Yes, is that What's his weight? Oh. Remember, mass and weight are different. It's like a slug and a pound. It's like a kilogram and a newton. And if I have a mass, how do I find the weight? F equals mg. What do we use for g? That's that. Right, that's our acceleration due to gravity. What's the value for it? It's a real simple value. 10. Right, so uh, the weight of mica is about 250 newtons. My r value. What's R for him? Two meters, thank you. And uh, what is my weight? 750, right? Remember F weight, the force weight is just M times G. And R is what I want to find. So I have 500 here divided by 750. That's equal to R. What is that? Um, it's like two thirds, like 0.7 meters. All right, isn't that right? That's 500. Or 250 goes into 500. Yeah, two thirds is 0.67 meters. What I did there is I just divided both sides by 750. So I get 500 and divided by 750, and I isolate the R. You could have to do a, a problem like that on the test, which is next week. Okay. Y'all could do that, though, if I gave it to you right now. The two meters. Oh, the two meters is the distance from here to the axis of rotation. Good question. So this, I give you the total distance of the seesaw. Two, mi two meters is just half time. Okay. Not too bad, right? Um, 
There are three types of levers. These are in your book. But you'll need to be able to identify them and also identify different parts, different types of levers in the body and otherwise. Uh, type number one, my fulcrum is in the middle. The fulcrum is where it's rotating. This is the most efficient of levers. My weight is down here, my load, and my effort, the force that I apply, is over here. This is class one. Said it's the most efficient. Uh, class two, the fulcrum is at the end. The weight is here, or the load, and the effort is here. That's class two. In class three, the uh, fulcrum is still at the end, but you switch the load and the effort. So my effort is there, and my load is there. And by the way, with the load, I've just drawn it as a as a block or whatever. But you know, you have this downward force now, which is equal to the force weight of whatever that load is. All right, this is a class three lever. Okay, ask you a question. We'll say this is A, B, and C. Class one, two, and three. Uh, this is a number. Sorry. Class one, two, and three. What about my bicep? All right. So I have this. My arm. Let's say I want to hold something in my arm. So my load is right here. My axis of rotation is back here, and my bicep attaches to my forearm to cause me to lift this. What type of lever is this? This system, meaning this is my moment arm, axis of rotation at my elbow, right? The bicep is connected to my forearm. What type of lever is this? Is it A, B, or C? A class one, a class two, or a class three lever. What type of lever is this? Five more seconds, just guess if you don't know, ask your neighbor if you like. Up at 42, 40, I'll go to 44. Okay, that's good. Because your, your bicep, right, your bicep attaches just a little bit north of your elbow, right? Otherwise, if it attached at the elbow, you'd just walk around like this all the time, because right? it wouldn't work. It has to attach at some point away from the axis of rotation just to function. Now, so your bicep attaches right about here. You have a load right here. So we're directly dealing with, uh, let's say, this one, right? This is the axis of rotation. My force, which is my bicep attached to the forearm, is right here, and then my load is down here. Okay. What about uh, another picture? I'll ask you what this is. Who is that woman? That's my wife. Is she beautiful? <laughs> yes. Yes, that's the right answer. Okay. This is a plate-loaded overhead press. Or what type of lever is that? Plate loaded overhead press, you usually sit in the seat, right? And you push like this. But here, I'm sorry, let me uh, throw it up. You see better? It's rotating here. There's a weight here. And then she's pushing up there. Is it class one, class two, or class three? A is one, B is two, C is three. All 
right. Doing well. Just a few more seconds. I'll stop at, uh, say, 30. Awesome. B is the right answer. It is a class two because I have my fulcrum right here. I have my load right here. And then I have my effort here. That's a class two by definition. Um, you know why you can never starve in the desert? Because of all the sandwiches there. Because of all the sandwiches there in the desert, that is. That's why you can never starve. Which is there. I mean, it's not as funny if you have to explain it. I'm not very good at jokes. Okay, um, let me get some more pages here. Okay, so you can see, you'll certainly have to identify some levers. If you look back at the old test, you'll see some different samples of that. What is the seesaw, by the way? Class 1, 2, or 3? Lever. That one's easy to identify. It's a one. Because anytime the fulcrum's in the middle, that's a class one lever. What about your head? Your book gave this one. I thought this was kind of cool. Your, your head, you know, your head moves back and forth like this. Now, the center of mass of your head, which we haven't talked about, but y'all read about, the center of mass of your head is, is slightly in front of your neck. Because right? if you just let your head go, it falls down like this, like when you fall asleep in class. But you guys do not fall asleep very much. I'm very impressed with y'all. Good students. You're a good student. And look at you all up in the front like this. Huh? You can't see very well. Yeah, I understand. Um, so, what was oh, the head. The head. No, it's not a third. It's a one, right? Because your axis of rotation is here, and you have muscles in the back of your head that help to pull it back. And then the load is this way. So your muscles that move your head are back here, but the, the load of your head is up in the front part. And so that is a seesaw. This is a seesaw. It's just like a seesaw. The effort is in the back. The load is in the front. All the weight of your head is, is towards the front of your face. All right. Um, Let's, there was a problem in your book like this. Let's let's work it. Uh, let's say that you have an arm. This is an arm. A four-fingered arm. But he's very strong. Okay? It's a very strong arm. And he wants to lift a bowling ball. There's a bowling ball here. Bowling ball is pretty heavy. Uh, we'll say it's about 10 kilograms. Pretty darn heavy bowling ball, actually. Okay? Let's say that the length of this guy's forearm, this guy is really me, actually, uh, is 40 centimeters. We'll call it 50 centimeters, which is equal to how many meters? What is 50 centimeters? 50 meters. Oh, come on, y'all know this. How many centimeters are in a meter? You don't have to know this, but you should know this. No, that's inches in a yard. But there are 100 centimeters in a meter. There's 100 of these. Huh? It's a half a meter. Right. So 50 centimeters is a half a meter. 0.5 meters. And the bicep, the muscles in this bicep, are attached, say, about 5 centimeters. 0 0.05 meters from the forearm. It's not that far. Your bicep is attached just a little bit away from the, uh, the elbow, not that far from the elbow. How much force is required from the bicep to keep this bowling ball in place? Now, first we need to figure out the weight of our load. The weight of our load is 10 kilograms times G. So that's what? 100 newtons. And then we need to balance our torques. We need to say that whatever torque this bowling ball is causing must be balanced by the torque of this bicep. 
It doesn't really matter clockwise, counterclockwise, or whatever. We're just going to say that they have to be equal. That the torque caused by the bicep has to equal the torque due to the bowling ball. So that's going to be the force of the bicep times 0.5 meters. I'm sorry, not 0.5 meters. What's the moment arm for the bicep? Is it the moment arm for the bicep? The moment arm is the distance from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied. Where's the axis of rotation in this guy? The elbow. And where is the force applied? How far from the elbow? 0 0.05 meters. That has to equal to the 100 newtons, because it has a really heavy bowling ball, but just to make the numbers easier, uh, times 0.5 meters. All right. So the force due to my bicep is going to be 100 times 0.5 divided by 0 0.05. All right. That's going to be a thousand newtons. So right, point five. Yeah, that's right. A thousand newtons. Your bicep has to exert extremely large forces to lift small things. Not extremely, but pretty large forces in order to lift modestly, modest weight things like a hundred newton bowling ball, which is a big bowling ball, but nonetheless, a thousand newtons, ten times the force here, uh, in order to lift this this bowling ball. And the reason is that it's applied at a short moment arm. So it's, again, like trying to open the door from right here. can't even do, right? Because the moment arm is too short. I have to provide a much bigger force in order to provide the necessary torque to, to move the load. Okay, this is a lot like the seesaw problem. It's just a different class of lever. Instead of a class one lever, uh, this is what? What do we say this is? A class three lever. That's right. Okay. One more thing, and your book talks about this a little bit. Your book talked about it in terms of the deltoid. Let me just show you the picture here. Where is that deltoid picture? Yeah, right here. The deltoid muscle in your shoulder which allows you to lift things. If you ever do that thing with a dumbbell where you lift it like this? Or it's your deltoid, as I understand. Y'all know better than I do, right? Y'all are, many of you are athletic training. That's right, right, it's deltoid. Yeah, so when you lift things like this, it, it works your deltoid muscle. But the deltoid, because you have such a small angle here, much of the force of the deltoid is not going into providing the torque at all. Because remember, the type of force that causes a torque is the force that's oriented in which way to the moment arm? Perpendicular. So this force, only a very small portion of it, is actually causing a torque that is perpendicular. A force that's about that big. A very, very small portion. That's why you see those huge guys over in the weight room, the guys that use like the 120 pound dumbbells. Who uses those things anyway? Why do they even buy them? Have y'all ever seen anybody use those? You have. The 150-pound dumbbells? Who? Okay. But any... Uh, anyway, even those big guys, when they do something like this, they're getting like the little bitty five-pound dumbbells, or maybe not the five-pound, but they're not lifting those big 150-pound dumbbells because you can't. The muscles just, because of the very oblique angle here, the small angle, they're not able to provide enough torque. You need an extremely large force because this angle is very small. So your torques can be small for a number of different reasons. You can have a short moment arm, uh, or you can have uh, the force is applied at a small angle. Your book talks about this in detail. Um, let's see, this is, it's the same for, the, hey, this is me, actually. 
So you can do this with, if you've ever done this, the oblique raise. It's sort of where you, you go up and down like this. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, the oblique muscles in your abs, there are those muscles on the side of your abs right here. They can lift your body, but they, uh, so this vector, this force vector is the force that's provided by those oblique abs, those oblique abdominal muscles. And notice that they also are acting at a very small angle, just like the deltoid muscles. And so it requires a lot of force in order to move your weight. All right. Um, okay. One. Let's move on to the A and P section. So again, in your book, it's split into the physics part and then the, uh, you know, the biology part. We won't spend as much time, at least not in this chapter, but in later chapters, the two are sort of more integrated. In this chapter, they're sort of separated more. You have three types of muscles. You need to know what these are and be able to identify them. You have the skeletal, the cardiac, and the smooth. Mostly, we'll talk about the skeletal muscles. Because those are the muscles that, that cause large external motions that connect to the skeleton. And they cause large external motions. The cardiac muscle is the heart. We'll talk about the heart. Which it might be next chapter, actually. Yeah, when we do fluids, we'll, we'll get into the heart and how it works and the different parts of the heart and what it does. And then the smooth muscles are used to move fluids in the body. Which we'll also get into in the next chapter. So three different types of muscles. The skeletal, the cardiac, and the smooth. Just know what they are. I think most of you probably know what they are anyway because you've had other classes that deal with this. Am I correct about that? Yeah. All right. So those three types of muscles. When you have the skeletal muscles, they attach to the bones at two different points. The skeletal muscles. Attached to the bones. At two points. The, um, the insertion point and the origin. And the insertion point is the end that causes the bone to move. And the, um, the origin is the end attached to the bone that doesn't move. All right, so for example, going back to our bicep example. If I'm moving my arm like this, my bicep is attached at two different places. I guess it's like attached up here, right? And then, is it all the way up here? Right, whatever, it's attached up in this area. And then it's also attached down here. Which of those is the insertion point? Is it here or is it here? The insertion. <laughs> yeah, down here. Because it's attached to the bone that moves. Whereas notice this part is not moving at all. So this part where the bicep is attached that's called the origin. That's where it originates. So be able to identify those and know what they are. Uh, also, we have joints in the skeleton. I go on down from here. Y'all know this? You've had this before? Almost everybody? It's in your book, too. They, they give a slightly more detailed description. 
uh, but they don't go into great depth. But, so the joints, you have uh, several different types of joints. No, I guess we'll just do one. And we're just going to do it just no real joints. So this is where two or more bones meet. And the snowmobile joint allows for large external movement. What's a good example of a synovial joint? The knee is a good example, right. So in the synovial joint, it allows you to, to move large motions. Uh, you have two bones that come together. The bones are covered in cartilage to protect them. And then you also have what in between them? Fluid. You have what type of fluid? Synovial fluid, right. So you have uh, two bones that come together. Cartilage covers the bones. And there's uh, synovial fluid in between the two bones. We'll talk about that later in a later chapter when we get into fluids. As you get older, that synovial fluid can deplete. But as I understand, one of your former students told me that they can actually take a needle and put more synovial fluid into your knee. You ever had that done? What's that? was uh, Ben. Y'all know Ben? Yeah, that guy. I love that guy. Isn't he great? Huh? Squints. I like Ben. Don't talk about that. Let me see. All right. He's a good guy. All right. So it's an overall bone. Uh, there's an overall fluid between the bones. That provides lubrication. Uh, let's see. I have a picture, I think. Yeah. So this is uh, these two joints coming together. They have the cartilage. Blow it up a little bit. Cartilage covering the bones on either end, and then you have the synovial fluid that's in between that provides this extra cushion. We had a question on our quiz about muscle tension. Uh, anytime you have a tension force, the tension is the same all throughout the material. I'll show you what I mean. So if I have a uh, piece of string or something, I'm sorry, I don't have, we'll just imagine that this is a rope. All right, so let's say I have this rope, and I'm pulling on it, and I pull on one end with 50 newtons, and I pull on this end also with 50 newtons. What's going to be the tension in my rope? What do you think? 50 newtons, right. It'll have 50 newtons. If I pull on this end with 50, and then as a result, I also have to pull on this end with 50, because otherwise it's just going to fly off in this direction. I'm going to have 50 newtons of tension all throughout the rope. So I have 50 newtons here, I have 50 newtons here, I have 50 newtons here, I have 50 newtons at the origin, I have 50 newtons at the insertion point, and I have 50 newtons everywhere in between. So anytime I have a tension force, whether it be in uh, a, pence, a very pencil-looking rope, or in a muscle, I'm going to have that tension felt all throughout the muscle or the rope or whatever. I'm going to have it at the insertion point, I'll have it at the origin, and I'll have it all throughout. So this tension is the same all throughout the material. Um, 
So we had a test question, or a, a quiz question, right? What was it? Something like that. Yeah, your, your bicep must exert a total force of 100 newtons. What is the force of the muscle at the insertion point? It's just whatever is required of your bicep, 100 newtons for that question. That was number eight. All right. So the tension is all throughout. And when our muscles contract, we have two different types of contractions. We have isotonic contraction. And we have isometric contraction. Uh, in the isotonic contraction, this is when the contraction causes the bone to move. And the isometric is what? What happens with the isometric? It doesn't move. It's just the opposite of isotonic. So the isometric contraction causes it to move. Excuse me. The isotonic contraction causes it to move. The isometric, the bone doesn't move. Your muscle is still contracting, but the bone isn't moving. Right? So if I, if I lift this, my muscles are contracting in order for me to lift this, but the bones aren't moving. And so that's an isometric contraction versus an isotonic contraction. All right, just be able to identify those. And let's see, um, we have several different types of movement in our joints. We can have gliding, angular, uh, and rotation. In gliding movement, uh, two flat bone surfaces glide across one another. What's an example of that? Gliding movement. I know. Right, your wrists and your hands. Right? You can have these two flat bone surfaces that will glide across one another. Like, for example, your wrist, your ankle. Uh, angular means the angle between the movable and the immovable bones change. good example of that one that we've been using. Right. So if you're doing a curl or whatever, uh, your immovable bone is right here. Your moving bone is right here. Or at least in this situation, this one's not moving. That is an angular movement. And then rotation, uh, the bone twists along its long axis. means it rotates, and everybody shows me an example of that, a rotation. Your knee? No, your knee is an angular, because it's... The shoulder? Yeah, this would work, yeah, this is, but this is also, I'm not saying no, I'm saying this is a rotation, okay? And then the hip, yes, th that would be, yeah, that would be, right? Yes, you know this better than I do, so. Huh? In what class? Okay, good. All right, um,
Okay, just one more thing, and that is with center of mass. The center of mass This is uh, the point where you can imagine all of the mass is located. Point in an object. There's a sort of more complicated mathematical definition that has to do with the distance of all the masses from a particular point in a body, that the sum of those has to be equal. But you can think of it as in terms of your, your own body. For a human being, the center of mass is right around here, right about the belly button or so. Uh, so that you can imagine that all of your mass is located in that point. Uh, however, I can change my center of mass. So say, for example, you know, my center of mass is right around here. What if I pick up this table? Where is my center of mass now? It's not only higher, but what else? It, no, my center of mass, it, it is where it is. It's just a point in space. My center of mass is actually moved out of my body. So my center of mass doesn't have to be in my body, right? In fact, for me to pick this up, I have to sort of keep from tipping over because my center of mass is right, right out here somewhere because I add this extra mass out at a farther distance from me. You follow me on that? Yeah. So your center of mass is, um, is just that point where you can imagine all the mass is located. You may have done this before, if I get this right, where you, you back up like this and you try to touch your toes. Can y'all do that? Let me see, Morgan. I don't believe you try it. You have to keep your legs straight up against the wall. Do you really think you can do it? Touch your toes flat against the wall. So reach down and touch your toes with your legs still touching the wall. You want to try? Go ahead and try. It's okay. Watch her do it, and then I'm going to be really embarrassed. But you can't touch anything. Oh, maybe she's more fun. <laughs> well, the thing is that if you do this, that your center of mass moves out away from your body. So as I'm standing up, my center of mass is right here, and so I can keep myself balanced. But if I move out like this, my center of mass moves out, and then I, I fall over. Unless you're, like, super flexible, I guess, like Morgan is. And then, okay? But it, it's very difficult, actually, to to bend over and touch your toes in that way because you'll just fall open because your center of mass changes. Let's watch a little video. This is about the Fosbury flop. Any of you ever do the high jump? Uh, the high jump? Anybody do the high jump? Who's done the high jump? You've done it? Like you competed or you just done it for fun? You ready? So do you know what the Fosbury flop is? Okay. It's the way that they used to do the high jump. They don't do it anymore that way. But it's that way where you come up, or I might be getting these switched up, but you come up and you jump with your legs. It's like your whole body goes up over the bar. Instead of now, when they sort of go backwards with their back over the bar. Let's watch this. This is a Veritasium video. And he talks about uh, center of mass and how that I get on YouTube, sorry. I tell y'all that I met that guy. What's that? Uh, would you like to see it again? <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, sorry. The, um, 
the, the center of mass, you can change your center of mass so that the center of mass actually goes underneath the bar instead of over the bar, like in the old days when you had to pull your legs up over the bar. I just realized that uh, there's another thing that I wanted to show you all regarding sort of the wall thing. I'm pretty sure that you're not going to be able to do this. Let's say that you stand up next to the wall like this. Right? I'm going to hold on to the wall. But what happens if I pull my leg out? Can you all do that? Think you can do that without holding on to the wall. Why can you not do that? Watch if I try to if I stand right up next to the wall. Y'all can try, try this later when you go out or, or have your friends try to do it. We did this in our Sunday school class and like all the kids thought that they could do it and then they all fell over on the ground. So if you pull your leg out, it causes your center of mass to go outside of your body, out here. And then that's going to cause you to fall over. Y'all try that. Try to stand up next to the wall with your foot up next to it, and your body and your arm up next to it, and then lift your, your other leg up, your leg away from the wall. Y'all do these things when I tell you about them? Make it on the quiz or something. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next chapter, chapter two. And again, the, uh, the reading quiz on Tuesday will cover all of chapter two. So go ahead and be reading that, but the test is not going to cover all of chapter 2, obviously. A little bit of time left. Okay, chapter 2 is on fluids. And so we're going to look at pressure and how pressure works. We'll look at the flow of fluids and like the Poisson equation. Um, and we'll look at the circulatory system and how blood flows through the circulatory system blood pressure, uh, we'll also see the eye and the pressure of the eye, pressure in the brain, pressure on, on bones or stress on bones, as well as in the, the bladder and other parts of the body. So there's a lot of applications for fluids in the body, as you know, a lot of fluids in the body, frankly. So um, first of all, we just want to define pressure. Pressure is defined as Whenever I write pressure, by the way, I'll use a capital P, and I'll put a little base upon it, and it'll let you know that that's a P, because we're also going to use the Greek letter rho, which looks a lot like a P. So my P will have a base on it. It's equal to a force per unit area. And remember, the units of force are newtons. The units of area are going to be square meters. Uh, so our pressure will have, in the SI units for pressure, will be a newton per square meter. But we can also, we have a whole bunch of other units as well. One newton per square meter actually is equal to one pascal. You may have heard the unit pascal before. That's our SI unit. The newton per square meter is just a pascal. But we have a whole bunch of other units that we have for pressure. And you should just sort of know that these exist. You can have them in uh, inches of mercury. Hg is the uh, symbol for mercury. Inches of mercury, we'll talk about what that means later in this chapter. The second one is millimeters of mercury. Use that to measure what? That unit. Millimeters of mercury. No. Blood pressure. Right. Blood pressure. When we talk about blood pressure, we're talking about millimeters of mercury. Uh, third is uh, atmospheres. Divers are familiar with this because divers use it to measure the pressure below the ocean surface. Uh, the fourth will be the kilopascal. But a kilopascal is really just what? What does kilo mean? A kilogram, when we talk about a kilogram, how does that compare to a single gram? How many grams are in a kilogram? How many grams are in a kilogram? A kilo means a kilo means a thousand. So a kilopascal, which is a unit that we might encounter, but probably not, just really means a thousand pascals. Pascal, by the way, is abbreviated as PA. Um, 
We can also see it in bars. As we see that in bars, this is equal to 100,000 pascals. And finally, we can see it in centimeters of H2O. Centimeters of water, or H2O. Uh, this one, this one, and this one are all measurements that are similar. And we'll talk about what that means using a manometer to measure the height of a column of liquid. But we'll see what that means as we go on later in this chapter. But those three are all operating by the same thing. You can have three possible sources of pressure in a fluid. Can I go down from here, y'all? Three possible sources. You can have, one, the weight of the fluid. These are possible sources of pressure in a fluid. One is just the weight of a fluid. So if I'm out in the ocean and I'm a diver, in the ocean he feels this immense pressure around him. That's just simply due to the weight of the fluid that's above him. It's the pressure that you feel when you put your head under the, under the water in the bathtub. You feel it pushing in on your face. That's the, the weight of the fluid. Second, you can have an external force applied to the fluid. This happens in pistons, and we'll see what how useful this is for pistons. Uh, this is a particular principle called the Pascal's principle, which we'll get to. So if I have a piston and I apply a force to it. If there's a fluid inside of there, I increase the pressure inside that piston. So we'll talk about that in terms of hydraulic systems. I have like a car jack and I have a little piston and I increase the force or I apply a force to the fluid. And then the third one is internal forces due to the interactions of molecules. Uh, this is an allusion to the ideal gas law. You've probably seen the ideal gas law, at least in high school, or maybe in some of your coursework, but that's that PV equals NRT. And we'll deal with that, but it, if you have a fluid, uh, whether it be a gas or a liquid, then the molecules are interacting with one another, and they can have their pressure just from those interact interactions of the molecules. All right, we'll look at each of those. Uh, let's look at the weight of the fluid, and then we'll probably wrap up with that. All right, so each of those three, the weight of the fluid, the external force, and then the internal interactions. The weight of the fluid, um, imagine that I have a container full of some liquid. And then I have some point down here that's underneath that liquid. Let's imagine that I build a little box down there. Okay, so I have this box. On top of this box, you can imagine that there's this column of water. Right? There's water all around it, but particularly right above the box, there is this column of water. That column of water is pushing down onto the box with a force that's equal to its weight. So that column of water has a particular weight, and the top of this box has a particular area. The pressure due to that column of water is equal to the weight divided by that area. So in a similar way, you have a column of fluid sitting on top of you right now. Right, what is that fluid sitting on top of you? Not like gravity, the air above you. So all of us are walking around with a column of air that goes from here all the way up to 
the outer atmosphere. That air is really heavy. Like, it doesn't feel very heavy right now, but if you get so much of it above you, that becomes to be quite a force that's pushing down on your head. Not only on your head, but on all parts of your body. That's our atmospheric pressure, which is due to this column of liquid that's pushing down on your body. Um, let me show you this little video, and then we will stop there. In this video, it's showing, it's a really cool video with this cool like middle schooler, and he's doing this experiment with his mom. I think his mom's really doing the experiment. But he does this thing with a newspaper and a pencil. I'll just let you watch it, and then uh, let me stop this.